everybody. So the reality is that developers have not learned about secure coding or crypto in schools. At university level, secure coding or software security is not part of the curriculum in most universities. At the same time, cyber attacks are on the increase. An increasing number of these attacks take place at the application layer. The best defense in this case is to develop software where the security has been already incorporated in. The OASP top 10 proactive controls consider security as part of the software development cycle. And this, in this session, we are just going to go through the security controls that you as developers can use while writing the code in order to produce more robust, secure products. For each of the controls, we are also going to explore of which of the most common vulnerabilities you can prevent, the OASP top 10 risks. I know that two days ago it has been released the candidate, uh, but this talk is, it is uh, based on the stable version, the 2013. My name is Katie Anton. I come from a software development background, just like yourselves, uh, primarily from PHP. I currently work at Veracode as application security consultant, where I work with developers around the world and help them secure their software. I also uh, lead the OASP Bristol chapter, so if you want to learn more about security or want to talk about security, please feel free uh, to come up to one of our sessions. And these are the, the most common vulnerabilities vulnerabilities. So like I said, this is the stable version. Um, there is one that they are working on now. Uh, but the question is, so these are the most common vulnerabilities that you find in software applications. But how many of you have actually tried to use these while writing the software? Like you write the software and you think about injection. I looked into it and I couldn't. In fact, I got stuck at A1 injection, where you have OS injection, LDAP injection, XML injection, SQL injection, just to name a few injections. And for each of these, you'll have a different defensive mechanism. And at that moment, I thought, OK, what am I going to supposed to do here? But more importantly, how can I explain it in very simple terms to my team of developers so they can use it while writing the code under very tight deadlines? Like I mentioned, prior to joining Veracode, I was head of development uh, <coughs> in uh, North Manchester, where I was leading a team of developers. We are producing software for retailers, and we had every two week releases. So I couldn't ask my team of developers to think of security of this top 10. The reality is that this is very well companies and security professionals that need to assess the security state of a software, like pen testers, for example, because they, it gives them a very nice checklist that they can assess the software against it, but it's not for developers. So the question is, as developers, what can we still use to produce a more secure software? What are the security techniques that we can use without being security experts that help us to prevent this And when we have this in the software, we also have the exploits. These are the, I've just done a small selection. You know that there are m more than this one. I didn't mention Yahoo that you just mentioned. But this is just a small selection that I took. These are the exploits that take place when we have those vulnerabilities. So for example, Talk Talk is started from an SQL injection. Ashley Madison, there has been a lot of material done there, and I'm going to use some of it into this presentation. Mossack Fonseca, unpatched software. They, they were on Drupal 7, I think. Uh, Cloud's pet, <coughs> unsecure storage. And um, that, uh, the casinos. That was a very interesting one, because what has happened is that the software that power the slot machines in your newest casinos was not secure enough. The numbers that this, uh, that software generated were not random enough. What this meant was that you could predict the next uh, numbers. 
And this is exactly what the attackers have done, is that they would load a sequence of numbers, analyze it, and then start predicting the next one, which means that they start increasing their wins. They would just win. So as developers, we write applications from large one, enterprise, web services, microservices, and websites, just like this gorgeous little website with balloons and butterflies. Regardless of the size of the application we we'll write, <coughs> from large to small, <coughs> the question is, how can we make it more secure? Where do we even start? A good starting point is the OWASP Application Security Verification Standard, or for short, ASVS. How many of you have heard about this? Here, oh, excellent. OK, so what this document can do is to help you first to choose the right level of security for your own application, where level one is the minimum level. Every application should be verified as, as, as a minimum at level one. Level two is for those applications that, in case of a data breach, OK, it's going to be embarrassing. It's going to create a little bit of mess that needs to be cleaned up, but it's not going to be the end of the world. And level three is for those applications that you really do care about, those applications that are really critical to the business. And in case of a database, well, there are going to be serious financial consequences. This is a very good document because it helps both developer and senior management within the business to have a common understanding of the appropriate level of security for their own applications. Uh, here is an extract of how it actually looks. So I just <clears throat> took an extract of the cryptography requirements. You can clearly see uh, which is the level each of the requirement applies to. If it applies to level one, or level two, or level three. And I, in particular, choose this one, the cryptography, where at 7.6 it says that when you need random number generators, then you, you better select uh, cryptographic modules that uh, are approved and uh, generate numbers that cannot be guessed by attackers. So in the case of the software for uh, casino slot, for slot machines, if this document would have been used, then that software would have not had that flow in it. So we can choose a document like ASVS to help us understand that what is the appropriate level of security for our own application. From there, extract the requir requirements appropriate for that level and use them into the software. Further on, we can use those requirements to create the test cases that can help us to verify for security early and often. And here we have the first control, verify for security early and often. And when we say to verify early and often, we actually refer to every stage of the software development cycle. Like, for example, you write your code, you are just in the development. You can actually do verification at the code review stage. Going back to the slot machines, you can add, for example, the cryptographic algorithms that your business needs to have into their software into your code review checklist standards. And that's where they can actually be uh, checked, verified. You can write your unit tests. Then you have finished your development, and now you commit. And you can actually use pre-commit hooks to make further checks. Some of the checks that you can do are AWS credentials, secret tokens, passwords. Don't allow them up into production. Other checks can be for dangerous functions. For example, eval. Uh, or I had a developer and kept committing the var dump and printr, which meant that it went into production not only that it created a bug, but also disclosed leaked, leaked information about the application. The way we solved it was pre commit fix. And now you prepare, you have commit the code, and it, it's in development, and then goes into release candidate. You can actually use, so like I mentioned, uh, you can use from the verification requirements to generate the tests. 
At this stage, you can use those functional tests to test for the security. You can automate this one using OSP ZAP. How many of you have heard of OSP ZAP? Few. You can combine Selenium tests with OSP ZAP. And then you can automate them by putting them into Jenkins, continuous integration, and then continuous delivery. So control number one helps you from the start, not as an afterthought, to prevent the all uh, top 10 risks. This control gives you a very nice framework where rather than thinking uh, of security requirements, of security as an afterthought, you actually incorporate the requirements from the beginning. And instead of testing for security at the end of a project or project phase, you actually automate it and make it part of your continuous integration and continuous delivery. Great, so let's see what else can we do. Well, <clears throat> 2017 and we still have these ones. In the case of SQL injection, this works when uh, tricking the parser and executing input as part of the SQL command. The best defense for this is to use parameterized queries. This help to uh, this prevent untrusted input from being interpreted as part of the SQL command. And in PHP, we can do, for example, like this, right, with PDO. And this is how we do it. Right? How many of you does it like this? <laughs> Great. OK, thanks. Good, because this is not the correct way, right? <laughs> Excellent. Um, there are versions of the wrong way in every single language. It is not this, this is not the only one. But the problem here was that the one string, uh, the input and uh, the command are in one string. So when you send them to the SQL parser, then the parser cannot differentiate between what's an input and what's the command. The correct way to do it is to separate the two. So we first write the SQL command with the placeholders, and then we use the bind parameters to bind your variables to those placeholders. This is a way to tell the SQL parser, now this is my command, and by the way, there are some placeholders there, and here are the variables that you are ne you'll need to use with those placeholders. The defense happens at the SQL parser level, because from that point on, the parser will consider any variables as simple strings. For this reason, the parameterized queries is the best defense against SQL injection. Uh, and use it correctly, uh, by binding the variables, you can help to prevent injection. Most types anyway, and I'm going to go a little bit further in this presentation into the types of SQL injection that this, this control cannot prevent. Okay, so another one is the cross-site scripting. This as well, it happens quite a lot. Uh, how any of you know what this one does? Okay, so this can look harmless. Not many people taking into account being serious enough. The problem is that it's from a simple cross-site scripting, you can actually get to bring down servers. And this was the case of an Apache network in 2010, where somebody posted on a forum uh, a message with a payload like this. The administrators of the forum would read the message. <coughs> Script will execute onto their browsers, send their cookies to the remote server, the attacker will use those cookies to log into the uh, forum. Once they are logged as admin, they change the permissions of a certain folder. And this allowed them to actually upload a script that will capture the credentials of the people logging onto this, that server. They are targeting, in particular, people with admin credentials. And once they had those credentials, they started testing other servers because many people would have the same credentials uh, used on multiple servers. So that was the case as well. So you'd have a person that would use the same credentials over and over again. So they could you go on to multiple servers, switch as root, and then from there uh, turning off uh, services. So it's, it's considered pretty, pretty dangerous. The best way to defend against this one is to encode your output. It's important to actually do it contextual encoding. Uh, now, and the best way for this is to actually use a library. In PHP, we have only this uh, tweak templating engine, which uh, encodes by default and by context 
and the Zeno framework. How many of you don't use either of these? Right, in that case, uh, you, you, if you would like to know more about it, uh, come and talk to me after because, uh, like I said, it's important to actually apply contextual encoding, which means that if your dynamic data is in HTML, you apply an encoding method. If it is in JavaScript, you apply a different encoding. In CSS, a different encoding. So it's, it's important to do it in the right way. Great, so um, using control number three, applying contextual encoding can help to prevent injection and cross-site scripting. What about data? Well, for this we have control number four, validate all your input. And when we refer to input, we actually refer to every uh, post and get, including the hidden fields, file uploads, um, <clears throat> HTTP headers, cookies, and data from the database. Because when we also validate the data from the database, this helps to prevent second order SQL injection. How many of you have heard of second order SQL injections? Few. For the benefit of those that haven't heard, I'm going to go for a simple example. So the second order SQL injection works when the data is stored into the database, stays there dormant until it's used in other parts of the system, and that's where the exploit actually occurs. So let's suppose now that we have uh, uh, already a user, John, but now we record another user, John single code dash dash, that is stored in the database. And this username, John single code dash dash, is going to become the SQL injection payload in other parts of the software. So let's suppose now that we go to change the password. So at this moment, the SQL command to change the password can become from <clears throat> changing the password for the <coughs> initial user to changing the password for another user. So we can say that we have successfully changed the password for a different user and have performed a second order SQL injection. The defense for this is to validate the input as well. <coughs> and validated all the input can help to prevent injection, including second order SQL injection. Um, cross site scripting and unvalidated redirects and forwards. So let's go back to our website where we started from. So we have, we can use a document like ASVS. <coughs> uh, from there, extract the appropriate level of security for that application. Use those requirements into the software and to generate the test cases that can help to verify for security early and often. We parameterize the queries by binding the variables. We contextually encode all the data and we validate all the input, in, including the one from the database. And just using these all the time, so you don't need to be security experts, you just do it in a consistent manner, then the, the application is already more secure. <clears throat> What else can we do? So this website, just like any other applications out there, will have sections that are for everybody and sections that are for certain users. For this, we have <coughs> control number five, identity and authentication controls. The subject of authentication is complex. In this session, we are just going to focus on a few best practices, like for example, uh, have a secure password storage, <clears throat> use multi-factor authentication, implement a secure password recovery mechanism, use TLS 1.2, have well-designed error messages, and uh, prevent brute force attacks. I'll go a little bit more in detail in each of these. When it comes to password storage, we want to make it difficult for the attackers that in case that the database is leaked, because your database will be leaked, as you know from Rob's talk, uh, it gives us time and it makes it difficult for them to actually reverse engineers to get the passwords. In PHP, you are lucky because we have the simple passwords. If you are on PHP on versions five, greater than uh, 5.5, um, under the hood, it uses strong cryptographic algorithms and some of the best sources of salt for salt. Uh, for this reason, they in, seven, in version se 7, they have actually removed the option to have your own salt. 
But when you store your password, it's important to be consistent and use strong cryptographic algorithms throughout your software. And this is an example from Ashley Madison website where they actually store the password using Bcrypt. Okay, good enough, approved by the cryptographers out there. But what they did next was that the same password that uh, the user would enter was used for a fast login key. And that, as you can see here, was with deprecated MD5. As soon as this was understood, it was very easy to crack the passwords. Now, when it comes to uh, a password uh, recovery mechanism, a good design workflow will, take in, will ask some security questions, will send a user uh, randomly a user-generated token, it will send it to a device, will um, verify for that token in the same session, and then change the password. It might not be the perfect workflow, but it is a multi-factor one, because first ask some security questions, something you know, then sends the token to a device, something you own. Also, error messages are important, and it's important to design the messages in such a manner that it does not disclose information about your users. And here is an example of how not to do it, and you can find quite a few of these out there. Uh, where you are, <clears throat> you have a message when the user is valid in the database, and a different message where the user is not found in the database. You don't need to be a hacker to figure out of which is the valid user, and which is not a registered user yet. All you need is to poke around the application a little bit, see how the application behaves in certain scenarios, and then see which is the user or not. So the way to do it is to actually use the same HTTP header, 200, okay, and the same HTML message in both scenarios. So like I said, the uh, subject of authentication is complex. In this session, we just touched on how to make it more <coughs> difficult for the attackers with uh, secure password storage, how to protect the identity of our users with a secure password recovery mechanism and with um, <clears throat> well-designed error messages. These are not the only controls, but it's a good start to protect against uh, broken authentication and session management. So we discuss about who is accessing. Uh, the next control is about what is accessed. This is about, do I have the right to see this page? Do I have the right to see the content of this page? And for this, we have control number six, implement appropriate access controls. To do it from the scratch is very, very difficult. The best way for this is to actually choose your framework that has already well-designed access controls in place. But once you have chosen the framework and you start implementing it, it's also important to see how you're going, which, which type of ACLs you're going to use. In the case of role-based access controls, especially the hard-coded one, one, every time you need to add a new role, you have to change the code, uh, change the test, prepare for release and deploy. Not only that is time consuming, but it's also um, prone to human error. This is, um, <clears throat> can easily become highly convoluted and it's easy to make a mistake. The other way to do it is to have a resource-based uh, access controls where you actually decouple your users and roles and store them in the database, and all you are interested in is, do I have the right permission to access this resource? So implementing appropriate access controls can help to prevent uh, insecure direct object refer reference and missing function level access control. What about the data, the data that is stored in the database and the data that is actually transferred for, between computers? For this, we have control number seven, protect the data. When it comes to data in transit, the best protection out there is still HTTPS, <coughs> uh, which helps with confidentiality. Spy cannot see your data integrity. Spy cannot change the data and authenticity it ensures that the server you intended to visit is the actual server we end up visiting. The HTTPS does not protect all types of man in the middle. You can improve on this by adding an extra header, and this is the strict transport security header. How many of you is using this? 
quite a few, but not as many as would be good. It's very easy to do it. You can, easy, you can either do it in your application, or you can do it uh, in the production via server configuration. What this do is that, by default, your browser will connect to uh, a remote server via HTTP, and that's the browser's default behavior. What this extra header does is that what it, once it is downloaded onto the client's browser, every time you will type into your location bar, example.com, the browser knows that to that website they can connect only via HTTPS. So from that point on, all any connection is going to be via HTTPS. When it comes to data at rest, the best cryptographic algorithm is also is uh, AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. Uh, you also need to be uh, to have a secure key management in place. These are for the keys that encrypt, decrypt the data. And to have appropriate um, access controls and auditing in place. And protecting the data both at rest and in transit can help to prevent uh, sensitive data exposure. So let's go back to our website. So we have a mechanism to verify for security early and often. We parameterize all the queries. We um, in contextual encode, the output validate all the inputs, including the one from the database. We implement appropriate authentication and access controls, and we protect the data both at rest and in transit. What else can we do? Well, another thing that we can improve is on the login and intrusion detection. For this, we have control number eight. Now, when it comes to logging, you sh it shouldn't be used only for debugging and troubleshooting. You can actually use it for Application monitoring, compliance monitoring, if your uh, application needs to be compliant or has to satisfy some compliance, and intrusion detection. And using an appropriate uh, logging mechanism in conjunction <coughs> with a good detection one can help to prevent all the OASP top 10 risks. What else can we do? Now, when it comes to security controls, some of them are quite complicated. To start them from the scratch, and Every time you write a new application or a new web service, not only that is time consuming, but can also lead to security design and implementation flaws. Think, for example, of access controls. It's not easy to do well from the scratch every time. Or even a library to prevent uh, cross-site scripting, uh, not so easy to do every time from the scratch. So another way to deal with this is to actually leverage security frameworks and libraries. And we can actually use, uh, uh, we can choose a framework that has well-designed access controls, has already CSRF protection. We can choose a library to prevent cross-site scripting, and then uh, we can select an ORM that can help us with SQL injection. These are just some examples. But there is a problem out there at the moment, and the problem is that there is quite a lot of software with vulnerable components. I don't have data for PHP, but in the case of Java applications, 97% of Java applications have at least one component with at least one known vulnerability. When we say that known vulnerabilities, we refer to the vulnerabilities that are publicly available on the internet for everyone to see uh, in databases. Uh, not only that one, but in some cases, you can also find the express script. So that's a little bit of a problem. And the, 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 pro, the, the source of the problem is that the proprietary code is entangled with the third-party components and the third-party libraries. Let's look, for example, at this. Uh, situation. So that's your own code. And now you bring a third-party component, an API. And that API has a library that ha depends on another library that depends on another library. It's very common in uh, with APIs that have a little bit of complexity. And you start implementing the functionality into your code. And then you add that functionality into a module, in, then in another module, and in another module. Soon enough, that library has touched hundreds or even thousands of points into your software. In the case of cross-site scripting, it can easily go into thousands of points. And now you have this, a vulnerability reported into one of those libraries that depend on the libraries. You don't even know of how that vulnerability, which is out there, 
actually affects your software. And to upgrade it, uh, it it's quite difficult to, now you think of the fact that you have about a thousand points. Now to put some controls in each of those, it, it's time consuming. So the problem is that just bringing in third party components, but not incorporate them and manage them appropriately. We are at risk of being breached via vulnerable components. At the end of the day, an attacker will not try to breach in through your nicely secure code if he can do the same thing with much less effort through a vulnerable component that is out there and there are already published exploits for it. So when we bring in third party components, how can we do it better? Well, the answer to this lies in to Robert C. Martin's book, Clean Code. How many of you have heard of Uncle Bob? Quite a few. How many of you have read the book? I was expecting this one. <laughs> so, and what he says there is that by wrapping your uh, third party uh, API, you minimize your dependencies. And if you want to change it in the future, you can do it without much penalty. Now, changing is as all an important one because think of the security is all, all, always a cat and mouse chase. You have the developer that does it and tries better, and then you have the attacker that breaks it, and the developer does it again, and the hacker breaks it again. So it's important to have this uh, flexibility. So uh, when it comes to design patterns, these are uh, some of the design patterns that you can use when you bring in your libraries. You can use a simple wrapper. If you would like to just expose into your code functionality that you need, so you're not interested in the functionality that you don't want. You can use an adapter if you need to change from the required interface to your own interface. And you can use facade for complex subsystems. So if you have a, a, a complex subsystem that you want to simplify the interaction of that one with your own software, this is a very good design pattern. You, it gives you, what it gives you in the end is it is one point. So the third party component touches your software into one point. If it appears a uh, vulnerability to any of these, then you have that one point that you can apply extra controls in place, or you have that one that where you can actually replace if needs be. So when coming, uh, when bringing in third party components, it's important to use from trusted sources. Uh, so th those libraries that are also regularly maintained and upgraded you should encapsulate them because in this way you hide unwanted information and then you reduce the attack surface. So like I said, you don't have a thousand points. You have only one point the facade in the, in the case of the facade where you actually control. Uh, and in this way, you actually have reduced your attack surface quite a bit. And also it's important to update them regularly or even replace them if they are not up to date anymore. So using control number nine, but using it correctly by um, updating these libraries all the time uh, can help to prevent all the last top 10. And the last one is error and exception handling. <clears throat> when it comes to errors, it is important to actually have uh, um, a centralized manner where uh, you manage your ex errors and exception handling in a centralized manner. You give the user all enough information to actually help them to continue the activity, but you do not disclose uh, leak information about your application, about the logic of your application um, or environment. Uh, and having in place well-designed error and exception handling can help to prevent all the OWASP top 10 risks. So let's go back to our website. We verify for security early and often. We parameterize all the queries by binding the variables, contextually encode the data, validate all the input, including the one from the database. We um, have implemented 
authentication and access controls, and we protect the data both at rest and in transit. We have implemented logging and, exception, um, and intrusion detection. For complex security controls, we leverage security and libraries and frameworks. And we have well-designed error and exception handling that does not leak critical information about the application, business logic, or environment. So if you'd like to know a little bit more about this project, you can go to the OASP uh, page. Uh, in this session, I've just touched on some of those. If you like, if you ha are interested in a little bit more in any of the controls and you would like to dive deeper, please go to the project page. It has resources and quite a good selection of cheat sheets for each of those. And because security doesn't have to be uh, dry and can be fun as well, I brought this, which is the snacks and ladders. So please um, help yourself. Um, I have brought more so you can take two or three, whatever you want. Uh, I don't plan to go with them back home, so I'm going to leave them here. Uh, but please help yourself and have fun. And uh, yeah, if if you like this to give a, uh, some feedback, any questions? I spoke quite fast, but any questions? Yes. Um, I thought the third party. Yes. Much about the composer command that checks the uh, packages and whether that is to be trusted. So apparently, it calls the dependencies, but I don't know where it finds out whether they are or aren't. Okay. Um, it's a little bit different from what you are saying. There is, uh, okay, so for libraries like, for languages like Java and uh, .NET, it is a was dependency check. And how does that works is that it checks, uh, it uses repository like Maven for Java, NuGet for uh, .NET. So it compares what you have with what's in the repository. It looks for repository composer would be the one of those. But then what it, that one does next is actually going through the databases of vulnerabilities and checks that hash of that library against what's out there publicly to see if there are any vulnerabilities against that particular library. I would, I'm not aware that the composer goes into the publicly available libraries. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's a little bit, I, yes, I have, yes, Rob. Let's follow up on that. The yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, I think this is the way I do it. That's yeah, that would be. But um, apart from the people from Symfony, I'm not uh, 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 that have that one. I haven't tested. I'm not aware of any other tool that would do this one. Any other questions? Yes. Um, HSDS headers for C7. Do you have to know anything about browser compatibility on that? Uh, yes. Um, According to the latest data, all the browsers should be compatible, including IE. The last one was IE that was lagging behind, but even that one should be now compatible. IE8 not No, no, I don't Why? think IE8. I can bring your table. Uh, I can bring your table, but as it is at the moment, all the browsers should be compatible. Yeah, it was just if you've got a legacy app where you have to provide shown to your Yes. Well spotted. So that's the answer. You just add it if they have it fine. If they don't, it's not compatible for very old browser browser doesn't do any damage. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, does uh, parameterizing queries not solve second order SQL? No, because you you should not trust your database. How can you trust the database? 
that data stays there. That's one of the <laughs> most asked questions that I get. That data is there. OK, so you have an application, but your application can be quite complex. It can have web services. You, as developers, cannot trust the data. Regardless, it can be in a very stored, in a strong Oracle, whatever, database. But it is possible. There is a possibility that that data can be tainted. For this reason, your application should deal with that one. And if you do both, uh, validate and uh, parameterize, then all you are doing, you are doing defense in depth, which should be done anyway. So, yes. Yes? My trouble with keeping track of that bug is that I'm scared of that. <laughs> what can we expect more of like those um, tech companies that are always kind of leaking data? It's very easy for us to kind of moan at them and some of them probably do make horrendous mistakes that are easy to laugh at. But it's very hard to um, kind of nail down every single thing uh, in every single piece of code that a company says leaking. So, what, what else? When it comes to large companies, they are usually breached through. It's very common to be breached. What happens out there? Large companies have a large number of websites. Most of the time, they don't know. They don't have an inventory. So they are breached through dead websites uh, that are not maintained or whatever. For, uh, but that's a bigger problem. So if you have a huge company like that, then you would have a different program where you start, start with. So now I'm not preaching about my company, but that's one of the things they do, do is that they don't have a program that actually starts from one IP and scans throughout, and then collect the data, the everything that is out out there, um, and create an inventory. Once you have an inventory, then you can actually do a quick scan to see what's the state of security of that application. Once you have that one, then you can actually come up with uh, a, a, a way to prioritize them. Because, and there are companies out there that will have easily hundreds or thousands. It is not uncommon to have thousands. So you need to have actually a structured way to deal with those. So you take from the most critical ones and the, that one. Uh, there are other companies that don't care at all uh, because, like Yahoo, because I still believe that thing. OK. Uh, but what happens is that um, <coughs> there is a lot of WAF and other things. But like I said, an increasing number of attacks takes place at the application layer. Um, you can get into through vulnerable components and patch software. Um, so that should be, once you have the inventory in that one, you can actually start in doing it. There is a lot of, I would say, maturity. Uh, in the States, they are a little bit more mature in terms of security, so they would understand this one. Uh, I, I work with teams and customers throughout the world. And I see that even in UK, I, sometimes I have difficult conversations because um, they are very protective. They are still at the stage of very protective of their own application, especially if it's a, a product manager that has been with that app for 10 years. Um, so it's, it, it's still, I, in Europe, I, I think it's, a little, it's going to take a little bit of more education. So there are more things. It's, it's not a simple answer. Any other questions? What would you like to achieve? I, I'm not familiar with the product. What do, uh, do you want to achieve? In the source code or in the application running? Uh, uh, in the application. Well, you can do that one with Zap or Burp. OWASP Zap okay. or Burp. 
So you can use those. Uh, like I said, you can then uh, put a zap into the headless mode uh, and do further tests, but that would be for a dynamic scanning. This would be the, the free ones uh, out there. There are also commercial products depending on the size of the company and how much you want to, are willing to pay and is that kind of compromise. But these are the free ones. Any other questions? Uh, honestly, I don't know anything else. Uh, the only way we would achieve with that something like that would be a source code analysis. That would help you out with that one. The other one is code review. In my previous job, I just had it into the code review checklist. Don't con concatenate, simple, and everybody could understand it. I mean, it was more behind it, but just don't concatenate. That would be... Again, uh, depending on the size of the company, you can go for the commercial tools source. Yes. OK, so no, for the, the uh, open source at the moment, no. It was, for PHP, it was a software, but now that team is moving to be commercial. So there is nothing at the moment. Uh, that will do it automatically. Any other questions? Thanks. So much. Thanks.